we've talked about. Mm. Convoluted is different. In this case, we're still talking about just a single break here. Okay. Right? So this could just be a simple fracture. All right. Um, so we're talking about angulation. We're going to see quite a few fractures where the fragments are angled to each other. And so when we talk about angles, a lot of times we'll talk about what happens to the piece, to the part of the fracture on the distal end of the proximal piece. Okay, what does that mean? That is a lot of work. So let's say I've got my arm here, right? Let's see, there's a break in my arm. So what is the proximal piece? Is it this one here or that one there? The one near your body. Sir. Right, the one near my body. So this is the proximal piece of the fracture. Of this proximal piece, what is the most distal end? The part by my thumb or the part by my pinky? Okay. By my pinky. So this is the distal end of the proximal fragment. Does that make sense? Yes. The proximal fragment is the part near the rest of my body. We're talking about the distal end of that fragment, the part right at the fracture. So depending on which way it's, we're going to take a look, see which way it's pointing in relation to the other fragment. So here, we've got radius and ulna, right? Over here, we've got like head of the um, ulna right here, right, the big thing. So you see ulna coming like this, and you see head of the ulna going like that. You see how they're coming at an angle, right? So here's my proximal piece, here's my distal piece. And so we just kind of like take a look at this angle, and we can describe the angle of the fracture. That's what we mean by apex angulation. We use the apex, the distal end of that fracture, to describe the angulation. This angulation is only there because of the fractures. So some fractures have an angle, and so we want to describe the angle, we use the apex angulation. Now, there's other ways we can describe angulation as well, and you will hear these terms especially if you are in your OR, your surgery rotations. You will hear varus, you will hear valgus. Varus, we're gonna look at this distal fragment of the fracture, do you see that? Right, proximal fragment, distal fragment. And they're not in a line, correct? They're bent. So, which way is this distal fragment bent compared to your proximal fragment? Did it bend? Medial or lateral? Medials. Medial? Does everyone else agree? If this is my pr proximal fragment, right, you draw a line here, which way it went did it go? It lateral medials. would be this way. Medial. Correct, so this is my proximal fragment. The distal fragment went lateral, or sorry, but medial compared to my yeah. proximal fragment. Do you see that? Yeah. How it's going medial to back towards the body? So that is called varus. Okay, so varus deformity, that distal fragment goes towards the body. The opposite is valgus. In this case, the fragment goes away. So I know you haven't covered lower extremity yet, but this is just an example. Here's the tibia. So this is medial, this is lateral. So you follow this long bone, and suddenly you see how it breaks in this direction. So it breaks towards the lateral direction. Do you see that? So that is a valgus deformity. Valgus has L in it, so think lateral when you see the L. Ah, that's a great trick. So valgus has the L, so L for lateral. Okay, just a few more things about fractures. We have simple fractures, also called closed fractures. This is just a fracture that does not break through the skin. As long as the skin is intact, it is a closed fracture. Compare that to an open fracture, the bone does break the skin, right? So you see that there is a wound, there's an injury, there is now an opening out into the environment. Right? These are gonna be usually a bit worse for the patient because now there is the possibility of an infection, a much higher possibility of an infection. The Dorito? You, uh, you, you mean the butterfly chip? Butterfly, I know. 
Yeah, I don't know why they didn't, didn't find the, the well, we'll get there, we'll discuss it. <laughs> um, and then we have partial fractures, right? These are fractures that don't go all the way through the bone. So, um, probably the most famous one is the green stick fracture. Right? This happens in kids. Instead of the bone breaking all the way, it only breaks part of the way, right? Part of it's still attached. Um, we also have the torus fracture. Does anyone know what a torus is? The bowl. A bowl? A bowl? Okay. Um, easiest way to describe a torus is a donut. Think of a torus. Different torus. So, that's right, there's the torus. Yeah. So, um, I just imagine that you've got a bone like this, right? And now the bone gets smushed together. Right? When you smush it together, that middle is going to pop out, almost like a donut, right? Now it looks like there's a donut surrounding the bowl. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. You see how it popped out like this? It's also called a buckle fracture. A buckle fracture, yes, very good. Right? Because the bone buckles, it, it kind of like cracks under the weight. It, it bends. doesn't break, but it bends. Mm -hmm. So that's what happens when you compress a bone from the two ends. So these are most common in children. Why? Because their bones are more flexible, they're not as hard, and so they're not going to break as easily. They're more likely to bend than break. Right? And so here's an example of a green stick. As you can see, right, you've got a partial break of the bone here. But if you look here, you've got a partial break. So if you um, follow the cortex, what is the cortex of the bone? It's the outer sheath. Yeah. It is the outer part of the bone. Right? What is the center of the bone called? Medulla cavity. Good, the medulla. Right, so the cortex is the outside. If you look at a bone like this, the cortex is this bright white outline of the bone, right? That's your cortex. So if you follow this cortex here, and you follow this white line, you see how there's this sudden interruption of the cortex. Right, this black line comes here and cuts through your cortex. That is a fracture. That's how you look for fractures. You look for breaks in the cortex. But on the other side here, follow this white line. Do you see any breaks at all? No, it stays solid, right? Solid white. So it's a partial break. It broke on one side, but not the other. That is a green stick fracture. Okay. And those are in incomplete fractures as opposed to complete fractures. And we've got a couple of these. We've got transverse, oblique, spiral. These are just named after your shape. So transverse fracture cuts across. Anyone see the fracture here in this image? It's the third, third digit. Third digit. Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. bone? Distal. 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 Distal phalanx of the third digit. So you look right here. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. The line just going straight across. Mm -hmm. Right. So fracture the very tip of that phalanx. Right there. Does that happen when you like drop something heavy on your finger? Right. So could have dropped something heavy on it. Um, sometimes you have people with use saws accidentally cut the finger off and fracture mm -hmm. it that way. Um, it would, um, so it'd be a yeah. lot sharper. If it so, by the way, I am going to send out this PowerPoint. If you are curious about these cases, I do try to include links to most of these cases down here. We'll include inf extra information as to what you're looking at and sometimes even how it happened. Okay, so, if you see anything interesting, you can try checking out that link. Okay, oblique fracture. Instead of going straight across, it's just at an angle. Right? Oblique. So, do you see the oblique fracture here in this image? Yeah, this way above your fingers, right? Right here. Is that easy to see? No. It's hard to see right here, correct? Hard to see on the AP. But you come to the lateral, and what happens? You can see it. Once again, 
What should you always try and do for your trauma x rays? Do AP and lateral. What's that called? What's that called? AP and lateral or. What's it called? Orthogonal. Very good. AP and lateral. Do you see why it's so important to get AP and lateral? If you're looking fast, you could miss this. Right? You only need to look for it because I wouldn't throw something up here if it didn't have a fracture. AP and lateral together is orthogonal. Orthogonal. Yes. So it is orthogonal is a pair of x rays. A pair of x rays that are 90 degrees to each other. One from the front, one from the side. All right, great. Spiral fracture. Based on its name, right, you can see that it just spirals. See how it does this neat spiral? Like that? By the way, Aliyah. What is this here? What what projection? That is the Nanias Muller. That looks good. so bad. <laughs> it does look bad, doesn't it? Yeah. The soft tissue is all in the way. Mm -hmm. Not enough angle. Needs more angle. Shame. Creepy. Right? <laughs> what is it, sir? This is a spiral fracture. Spiral Of the femur. This is of the femur. Okay, mm -hmm. coming into fracture, this is your fragmented fracture, where you have three or more fragments of bone, okay, more than two pieces, right? Usually some sort of crushing fracture. So you've got things like this, segmental, right? Three pieces. Right. One, two, three, three pieces. So is that more than three or two or more? more so than two. two or more. So same as, so sorry, no, sorry, more than two. Just three or more pieces. Correct. Split into segments. So if it's like a, if they're separate, they're all segmental. Because so, so every single cut would be like more than two, right? What is that? Anything more than a hairline fracture would be more than two, right? So something like this, right? Proximal piece, distal piece. This is not segmental. But that's more than two, right? It only has two pieces, proximal and distal. Only two pieces. This has three pieces, right? Proximal, middle, distal. And these also, these tiny things here. Mm -hmm. So this one would be segmental, right? Once again, proximal, middle, and distal. That's a segmental fracture. At least, minimum, three pieces. And that's a comminuted fracture, right? Right, so this is an example of a comminuted fracture. Butterfly fracture, That's a also known as the Dorito <laughs> chip fracture by the class of 23. So if you take a look here, right? Proximal piece, distal piece, Dorito chip. It's really called a butterfly, don't remember the chip. I guess, butterfly, right? But do you see how it kind of looks like a butterfly? Mm -hmm. right. What do you, what do you call the chip? I like the chip. The 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 chip. chip. Yeah. Just middle. Okay, so same thing over here. Do you see the proximal piece here? Distal piece here, and then there's this fragment right here. Right. So that, and that'll be segmental. What is that? That one's segmental, the one before. So we, so we call this butterfly. But that has three Because three this middle piece is a triangle. But segmental is like three tubes. Sorry, I think it's because it's not fully suspended. the two and the middle piece is like a triangle. So it's it's still intact. Correct, so the middle piece is like a triangle. So it's still connected. Or sorry, if the middle piece is like a triangle, it's butterfly. If the middle piece is like a tube, right, if it's still a column, that is segmental. Okay, so it's just a chip. It's this small triangular chip of the bone. Hmm? Sorry, it's kind of a big chip on the right side, but it's still a chip. It's still a triangle. Yeah. Uh-huh. Is that an oblique? Because I don't see. Um, no, on the other side. On this one? Yeah, this is not an oblique. On the fibula? Oh, on the fibula? Yeah, there. I didn't see ah. that. Oh, uh, yeah, that would be oblique. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, but the concept you did on the other fracture here, right? You know, you said that the Yeah, in that case, I was primarily talking yeah, about the tissue. Yeah. Remember, right? You can talk about multiple bones with multiple types of fractures. You can say, Tibia has this kind of fracture, fibula has that kind of fracture, right? Radius has one kind of fracture, ulna has another kind of fracture. 
Okay, over here, splintered fracture. This is what we normally think about with common users, right? Lots of pieces. In this case, the person got shot in the leg, and so the bone basically exploded. Okay, so you've got all these tiny fragments. By the way, anyone know what these super bright dots are? It's lead. Lead. Why is there lead in the patient? Bullet. Right, bullet fragments. Very good. I thought you were going to ask about the caliber. No, I didn't. If you could tell that from the fragments, I'd be very interested. Yeah, how Probably you, forty-five. How can you say it's bullet and not a piece of bone? Because it's much brighter than the bone. Do you see how how white this is compared to the bone? Do you see how it shows up super bright against the bone? So remember, if you think about our radial densities, what is the most radial dense, most radial opaque substance? Metal. So metal shows up what color? White. white. It shows up the whitest. So what is the most white color here? Small dots. These small fragments, right? Even more white than the bone. Mm -hmm. Yes? What's all that on like, like what is all those lines in it? Artifacts. Oh, yeah. He's what are these lines? Sweatpants. Oh, pants. Yeah. Blue jeans. Mm, yes. Most kind of jeans. jeans. Oh. Very good. Hmm? Could be black jeans. If you don't change your patient, oh. <laughs> right? If you don't change your patient, <laughs> this is how your x ray will look. <laughs> it could look messy like this. What's that called? Artifacts. Artifacts. Mm. Artifacts. Mm. So, so, like, what are the Exactly. Yeah. They cut off. <laughs> exactly. They will cut off the patient's clothes in this kind of situation. Yeah, this is kind of important. Actually, funny story, because at Ben Top, right, they all, they're really used to this stuff, so patient comes in, immediate, nurse immediately has the shears, just, <laughs> just cuts off everything, right? Mm -hmm. Shirt, pants, doesn't matter, right? <laughs> Get them completely naked, throw on the gown, and good to go. Well, this one time patient came in with a Texans jersey. Nurse pulls out the shears, and I was like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Jerseys are expensive. Yeah. Let's try and save it. <laughs> so they carefully take the jersey off the patient, and then yeah, cut off everything else. I was like, <laughs> did the patient say what they did? Oh, I, 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 was just, I was just laughing at them. Oh, that was funny. They didn't just cut off your expensive pair of pants. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you could have the most expensive pair, pair, pair of pants in the world. Just <laughs> <laughs> but Texans jersey, oh, we've got to save that. <laughs> okay, uh, impacted fracture. Um, in this case, you have a fracture and one piece of the fracture gets shoved into the other. So let's say that we've got the humerus here, right? Here's the head of the humerus. Here's the shaft, right? And now let's say there's a fract there's an accident which forces <coughs> the bone this way, right? Like this. Mm -hmm. But let's say the head of the humerus can't go any further. Mm -hmm. What's gonna happen? Mm -hmm. It's gonna go yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. Right? Impacted, it's gonna get pushed into that fragment. Is it like a tubing? Almost like a tubing. Yes, like the tubing, but for bones. Could that also be considered as a buckle fracture? No, buckle yeah. fractures are incomplete. This is a okay. complete fracture. The cortex actually breaks. Where is it? Uh, so, do you see this break in the cortex right here? How it's white? How it's white here? So, this fragment got shoved in like that. You can actually see the this cortex go further in than it's supposed to. A couple more. Right in this case, we've got which bone right here? Radius. Radius, very good. And you can see the shaft of the radius got shoved in into this very distal end of the radius here. Do you see that? You see the cortex here? But you also see the cortex here. So this got shoved in. Would that also be, uh, you kind of, is it like similar to the, the donut one you were talking about, the buckle? It's similar, but the buckle or the torus is a partial fracture. The cortex does not break. Here, the cortex is completely broken. They're completely separated. So it's overlapped. Overlapped. Mm -hmm. Or inside each other. And then same thing on this side as well. So, impacted. Okay, so lots of different fractures. How do we fix them? 
If we fix a fracture, it is called reduction. Okay. You'll also hear this for dislocations as well. We're going to reduce the dislocation. Basically, put it back into place. So there's two ways to reduce things. You can do it closed. You can do it open. Guess what the difference is? Surgical and non-surgical. Surgical and non-surgical. Well, mm, close. When you say surgical, exactly what do you mean? What are you thinking? You're kind of Great, you're opening up the patient. You've got a scalpel, you need to actually cut open and break the skin. So there are surgical close reductions. For example, um, sometimes a dislocation is so bad that we need to put the patient under where they can't feel any pain before we try and reduce it while still closed. Or we'll do a close reduction um, you, under like mini C arm, where the doctor will just kind of like yank at the patient's wrist and elbow until the bones get about in cor the correct place, and then they'll just quickly splint and wrap up the arm. Never needs to cut open the patient. So, close it when the skin is and open it when you have to go into Correct. Close the skin intact, open as we need to cut open the skin. So, in surgery, most of the reductions you will see are open. So you have ORIF, open reduction internal fixation. But sometimes you might have CRPPs, closed reduction percutaneous pinning. Okay. But the entire idea is that reduction is just a way to fix the fracture or a way to fix the dislocation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, so with what little time we have left, Let's talk about some fun fractures. Okay, number one, Barton fracture. If you take a look here, this is going to be of the wrist. You've got which bone right here? Radius. Radius, and you see what happened to it? Right, you've got this kind of oblique fracture. It cuts from the side into the joint space, which leads to the carpus, right? So it breaks the part of the bone which would normally articulate with the carpal, as opposed to the articular surface. So how does this uh, definition go? How does it break to the posterior lip of the distal radius? Break to the posterior lip of the distal radius. Great, so we start here at the articular surface, and where's the posterior part of this patient? Is, it, is this posterior, or is this posterior? Up is anterior, bottom is posterior, I suppose. Okay, so take your hand, hold it exactly like this. Where is the anterior portion of your body? This is anterior, correct? Where's the posterior portion? This is posterior. So the posterior lip, from the articular surface to the posterior lip. That is what that means. Does it make sense? Okay, think about it a little more. Just keep thinking about that. So, that is the Barton fracture. The key to the Barton fracture is that it must break into the articular surface, right? It must reach this radial carpal joint. What do you mean by articular surface? Huh? Articular is where the joint is. So it must reach the part of the bone that forms the joint. Okay, here are some examples. This is what kind of wrist X-ray? Must be PA like PA. PA wrist, must very good. Be PA for good. So you can see the fracture here, right? If you look here, this fracture cuts from here into this part of the radius right there, right? So this is going to be the articular surface. It's really close, but you can see it right there. Now. We've got baseball finger, also known as mallet finger. So this deals with the distal phalanges. It doesn't have to be the thumb, but the thumb could be affected. Like the idea is, all right, you're playing baseball, right? Throws the ball, you're like, okay, I've got it, I've got it. Try and catch it. Baseball comes by, you barely miss. Hits the finger right here. What happens when it hits this finger? Well, you're gonna have a bunch of forces going on. This distal part of the finger is gonna get pulled, right? 
So these two parts of the fingers are getting kind of twisted like this. Here, there's a ligament holding on to this part of the bone. The ligament holds on tight, the rest of this finger tries to twist, and it cracks the finger right there. So you have this pulling motion where the ligament pulled part of the bone off. That is called an avulsion fracture. Does that make sense? Okay, so ball hits the end of an extended finger, right, or something happens to the end of the extended finger where you have this pulling motion or this external force against it, and it causes the ligament to rip a part of the bone off that distal phalanx. Yeah. Are we okay with this one? What do you mean by extensor tendon terminates? That's the definition I have. So, um, injury of the dip joint where extensor tendon terminates. Okay, so you'll need to look into what those terms mean. Right? There's no point writing down a definition if you don't know what the words you're writing down mean. Right? So you need to figure out what an extensor tendon is. All right, so let's move on. Bennett fracture. This is, so for Bennett fracture, know that it deals with the first metacarpal. Where's the first metacarpal? Great, it's over here by the thumb. Do you see the fracture? Yes, sir. Where is it? What part of the Before the base, sir. Great, do you see this right there? You see that right there? Very good. That's right, Ricky. Go ahead and point to that on the TV. Very good. Is that like the butterfly? So this right. is not a butterfly. This should just be a two-piece fracture. This long bone stays intact, but this triangle piece came off the bone. Isn't that a butterfly? Butterfly, remember, at least three pieces. Two long pieces and a triangle in between. Hmm. Oh, yeah. oh, butterfly is two long pieces and a triangle in between. Yeah, Yes, it looks like a Dorito chip. Okay, once again, this enters the joint space, right? So this comes here and cuts into the carpal metacarpal joint, the CMC joint, first CMC joint. Right. Some more examples. Do you see the Bennett fracture on this image here? Yes. See that right there? See how it cuts straight into the joint right there? What about on this image? Do you see it? See this right there? All right, so here's that triangular piece, right, and here's the rest of the metacarpal. Um, what view of the first digit is this? Pie? Oblique? Lateral? It's not lateral, it's not a knee. So, how does the hand look? Hand looks PA. If the hand is PA, how is the thumb? Oblique. Oblique. Very good. So, this is an oblique of the thumb. Okay, what about this one? How does this look? It almost looks like an honor deviation, right? Yeah. But this is more of a lateral thumb. This is more of a lateral first digit, right? Okay. So if you take a look here, right? Look at the shape of the yeah. phalanges, right? You see how this curve matches the curve of my finger when it turns sideways? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So lateral first digit. So hands doing something like this right now. Is that a good, would that be like a good x-ray for that? Like the way that it's cut, like it looks like you've got the wheel on the top there. So, yeah, so I mean, yeah, you can see this pretty well. I mean, yeah, but it's like, you know, that's okay. Just go with your positioning. It will show your fracture. Fracture does not have to be centered. The main thing is that we see all the bones because this may not be the only fracture that the patient has. So as long as you show, as long as you show all the anatomy, that's what matters. And that's right? why you'll notice at Bentov they'll do a whole PA hand, even if they're looking at just the phalanges. They're just mm -hmm. making sure that they get everything that they need So bended fracture, first metacarpal. Right. 
Boxer fracture. We go to the other side of the hand. Which metacarpal is this? It's the fifth. Fifth. Great. Well, fourth or fifth metacarpal. But my idea is, okay, you're boxing, right? And you go and you try and hit someone, and instead of hitting them here with the knuckles, you swing and you hit them with this fifth knuckle right here. And that force, bam, breaks this fifth metacarpal. So when do you see this? This is actually very, very common in the clinics. Not because people are boxing each other, but because people get mad and they punch a wall. <laughs> and when they punch the wall, they hit it like this with the pinky side of their hand, and it breaks their metacarpal. Or in the case of one of my patients, they punched a uh, straight leg, right? But same thing. So if you take a look here, it might be a bit tough to tell on this lateral, but the break is right here. And it's right here by the head of the fifth metacarpal. Most times I've seen this, it's always the ending. Mm -hmm. So what about on this one? Is it a bit easier to see now? Yeah. See that right there? You see it right there? So that is your boxer fracture. Fifth metacarpal, sometimes even fourth metacarpal, depending on how hard they punch. Okay. So for the second picture, the patient was able to move themselves into that position, this or one? did the, mm -hmm. or did the, yeah. would the tech have to like spread apart their hand? So for this one, it does look. I would assume that the patient could move. Um, from my experience, even if a patient has a boxer fracture, they are able to move around okay. Now, if you do take a look at this picture, right, and you take a look at what the fingers look like, was this done with the hand fingertips on the cassette, or was this done as an oblique hand fingertips off the cassette? Oblique. What do you think for this on it. oblique? For the fingertips on the cassette? No, on. Off. Or really on off. Cassette. Oh, off the cassette. On. I say on. Look at the thumb. I, I hear on, I hear off. Look at the second. Here we go. Oh, I think it's on the cassette. Okay, so here's the trick. If the patient places the fingertips on the cassette, two things will happen. One, the phalanges will become foreshortened. They will look shorter than normal. Two, the joint spaces will disappear. Because the joints are angled, you will not be able to see through them. Take a look at this PA. Do you see the joint spaces here? Yes. Do you see the length of these phalanges? Mm -hmm. Now, move to this oblique. Do you see joint spaces anymore? No. no, they are superimposed here. If you take a look at the length of this phalange, does that look? the same as the length here. No. no, it looks foreshortened. So, this was positioned with fingertips down. Is this acceptable? Yes, because yes. that's what you're looking for. Right, so what are we looking for? A fracture in the metacarpals. Are we allowed to do fingertips down if we're looking at metacarpals? Yes. Yes. Very good. So this is a great example of when you would want to do an oblique hand with fingertips down. So this is acceptable. So this is acceptable. Even with the marker? The digital marker is... So what do you mean fingertips down? Yes. So does it depend on facility or just the tech preference? Because I've noticed that when I try to do the one where they don't touch, they mm -hmm. correct me on every, every single time I try to do it. Um... Part facility, part tech preference. Well, in the clinic, in the rotation I'm in right now, they do this because they get a lot of rheumatology patients. Mm -hmm. Correct. Very good. So, yeah, part of it's going to be the clinic. Depending on what kind of clinic it is, they may require um, certain types of views or certain positions for the fingertips. And if they don't specify, then at that point, it's up to you as a tech. Some techs are lazy and, or I don't want to, sorry, they're not lazy, they're efficient. Okay, no, they're lazy. So sometimes they're lazy to just put the fingertips on the board because it's easy to keep the patients in position, right, when their fingertips are touching. Right? Some techs go the extra step and lift the fingertips up, take the time to try and make sure they're steady to show the joint spaces. 
But it's really up to just what you're looking for. And do the phalanges have to be curled? They do not have to be curled. See, I hate, ooh. I personally prefer by putting these to be straight. Because when they're touching, they're like, they have to curl up. Oh my, I don't want it. Let's make it All right. Now, remember. I have to open it. So, remember that Barton fracture from earlier? Yes. Remember how it cut through the articular surface of the radius. Mm -hmm. Now we have the Cody's fracture. It looks very similar, except instead of going to the articular surface, it goes straight across the radial neck. Do you see that? It just takes the head off. Correct, just takes the head off. So this is the Cody's fracture. And now, this is the key part about Cody's fractures. Not only does it cut across the neck and take the head off, the head angles itself. And the head angles itself posteriorly. That is the key point. The head goes posterior. So why would this fracture happen? You're walking around, you trip, you fall, you stretch out your hands, you land, and this bone breaks. And because your hand is like this, it breaks backwards, it breaks up towards you. And that's why this piece comes this way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the fracture happens, a Cody's fracture happens, when a patient falls, tries to catch themselves, and that force breaks the bone posteriorly. This is called a fush. Right, what is a fush? Fall on an outstretched hand. Fell on an outstretched hand. Does that make sense? So sometimes your reasoning, for example, would just be fush. Right? It's not a misspelling. They didn't mean to type fish. It is fush. Is it more common in women? Um, I'm not gonna, it's not more common in women. It's just common in people that tend to fall. So older patients. But it's said in the book. Yeah. Or just say it was more common than women. Yeah, it's in a book. Yeah. Oh, okay. Asking. Great. Good to know. Thank you. Thank you for teaching me. No, no, no. I was just asking because mm -hmm. I didn't want my information to be wrong. You know, mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. I was excited for her. Mm -hmm. yeah, it just said when I went on the osteoporosis. So, know, right. So, if I had to guess then, the reason would be because. When women go through menopause, those hormones tend to cause osteoporosis. They yeah. tend to cause bone I think, weakening. I think they gave this explanation as well. Or maybe I Googled it. Oh, Alright, great. Oh, okay. okay, so it, it, um, it is time to end class for today. Um, any questions on anything we talked about? Yeah. Is this a, hopefully a bit more interesting than just pathology? Yeah. Can I talk about all these different crazy breaks? Right. So yes, that's the that is going to be the tough part of this chapter, right? In chest pathology, a lot of the names were based off your medical terminology. You could use them to figure out what it was, right? Pneumo peritoneum. Well, pneumo air peritoneum, air in the peritoneum. Cody's fracture. It's just named after Mr. Cody, right? Yeah. So there is going to be a lot more memorization of just random names in this chapter, right? Barton, Bennett, Coley, Smith, Hutchinson, Montagia, right? Just a lot of names. When are you going to send that one? Um, I should hopefully have it done by the end of the day. Okay, because that's a lot. Oh, God. Okay, so... Um, if you would just leave